tonight on Focal Point. International Women's Day is a celebration of women throughout this planet, but it's also a real opportunity to put the spotlight on the discrimination and the inhuman and degrading treatment that women in many, many parts of this earth suffer every day. There are lots of ways in which people united to deal with many issues that they shared as problems. So from a community relations point of view, there are lots of messages in history that are absolutely alive and kicking today that we can learn from. We're 20 years now almost after the Good Friday Agreement. We're a post-conflict society moving on. And when we remember the past, we have to get it across to people. We're also remembering the future. The majority of our circle plaques commemorate those men who have made history. It's highly fitting that this morning's plaque is to a woman who made an outstanding contribution to the artistic life of this city. Her choreography was work of genius. There were some things I've never ever seen or heard of anybody who could portray anything she could portray using just the dancers themselves, using just dance. Parents genuinely want to, to get the best for their children. They're looking for something that will help their children develop in life. They want their children to have fun, they want their children to enjoy themselves, they want them to be stimulated. They want to know that when they go out to an event that they'll be cared for, that people will respect them, them and their children. Come here today in solidarity with the sisterhood in Belfast and uh, across the world. Um, it's International Women's Day, it's a very important day for us to come together to celebrate and to understand that the job isn't done yet, that we've still got a lot of inequality in the world and particularly at the moment uh, I would say that we're, we're thinking about the women in the Congo um, and um, in the Middle East. International Women's Day is a celebration of women throughout this planet but it's also a real opportunity to put the spotlight on the discrimination and the inhuman and degrading treatment that women in many, many parts of this earth suffer every day. I think that whatever issues the community have are issues of women. Whatever women's issues are are the issues of the community. Like, they all intersperse because women are a part of the community. Any issue that affects the community affects women. Any issue that affects women affects the community adversely. I think that during the conflict, certainly, um women's rights and, and the equality agenda, um, well, it really wasn't on the agenda. Um, and as we are coming out of conflict, um, you would have, you know, you would have expected for women to be part of that process, and women haven't. And that's why women have been involved in various, you know, community um, initiatives um, to have their voices heard. Women have played a key role, not only in the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement, but also in their communities over the years of the conflict. And I think that needs to be recognised, um, the role that they did play, and I think it needs to be supported. I don't think we would have a peace process if it wasn't for women in this community. Um, they bore the brunt of conflict. They were in the forefront of the search for peace. Uh, they're not benefiting from the peace process in the way we were promised back in 1998. Uh, so that's serious unfinished business. Women are st still should feature very, very strongly in the peace process and within the community because it's from the grassroots that that peace will be built. And events like today and all the incredible events that have been happening over the last uh, week and more to come are uh, really not just about enjoyment because that's important, but about recognising that uh, the impoverishment of women in our society here in Northern Ireland today gets worse. A lot of young women here today and a couple of my young nieces that are here, um, they actually, one of them actually made a statement while we were standing here, I'm not a feminist, and I said, you are a feminist. You are a feminist because you wouldn't have the rights that you have now if you didn't have strong opinions and if the women that had come before you hadn't fought the, fo the fight that they fought. But um, and I'm particularly thinking um, at the moment about women that have led in the past and that aren't here at the moment. The struggle still continues. Um, and someone said to me a couple of years ago, we fought the fight, we have to hold the ground. And it is a case of holding the ground and bringing the younger women up that are going to be able to do that for us. The women played a very strong part in building peace. 
um, I think particularly of the Women's Coalition, the politics group, um, who disbanded unfortunately. And um, we still have a lack of women in decision making and we need to bring them to the fore again. I mean, if we take the, uh, the latest round of um, last year, the, the um, Haas O'Sullivan initiatives, um, you know, there was two women who were sitting around the table um, out of, you know, out of 14 men. And that's what um, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 is all about. That in, in conflicts that, um, that the rights of women, you know, in terms of protection and representation and post-conflict um, reconstruction, women's voices should be heard and they should be playing a part in that. But unfortunately, um, our government and the, the UK government doesn't um, recognise uh, 1325 and it hasn't been implemented here. By fixing women's rights, we will inevitably fix the community and bring more peace. On the one hand, it has brought a certain degree of stability to communities. Um, I think we still have a bit to go. I think it's a, a work in progress, if you like. And I think... Um, uh, to be honest, I think the, the role of women hasn't been recognised as much as it should have and I think valued as much as it should have. So I think we have a long way to go in terms of recognising the contribution that women have made, not only the process but also within their communities. There has to be more women within the community speaking up because women have always been the peace bearers. Women in the community and in the trade union movements have all stood up for peace, stood against injustices over the past generations. It's time for this generation to stand up and make their voices heard. And as you can see, it's not just women here today. It's, you know, it's men, it's, there's children, you know, there's families, there's, uh, you know, across the generations. Um, and it's about that coming together and, you know, for today, it's about celebrating our achievements. But the fight still goes on. There's still a, a lot more to be achieved. of a decade of centenaries on the island of Ireland, you know, which started with the Covenant celebrations of 1912, the Great War. We're now approaching 1916 and the Battle of the Somme. And really, here we have librarians, uh, we have archivists, uh, we have historians, we have museum people who are actually looking forward to marking these centenaries um, for the wider community and nuancing in such a way that we have a sense of a shared history of this very important decade which shaped two Irish states. The complexity of the period is one of the things that we're trying to communicate because there are lots of ways in which people united to deal with many issues that they shared as problems. So from a community relations point of view, there are lots of messages in history that are absolutely alive and kicking today that we can learn from. How important is it that we fund and give organisations the opportunity to get the resources to explore, discuss and educate people on our priorities and history? We think it is absolutely critical. Our role is to fund history and heritage projects right across the UK. Uh, the First World War is a huge centenary and a huge event that affected all communities across the UK. Therefore, we felt it was essential to set up a grant programme that would enable communities to be able to explore their own stories, research the truth of what happened in their areas. Here in Northern Ireland there's the added complexity of the decade of centenaries where there was lots of political events happening and we were very keen that communities could explore the truth of what happened in their areas and maybe challenge some of the established narratives that have been here in Northern Ireland for a long time. By exploring our history, what do you think that we can learn from it and can we apply it to today's society and improve better community relationships? Well, we have four principles when we are looking at history. We ask people to think about the facts and to stick to the facts rather than the myths that can gather around them sometimes. So facts first and foremost. Then to recognise that there are different views of what happened during any particular period in time. So we don't have one history, we have many views of history. And, and if we can take that into account, we can also begin to think about how our actions impacted on other people and that also helps us get a broader sense of our place in a, in a wider and diverse society uh, and to do that all in the context of recognising we all have to live together in this place so if we can take that into account in history we can hopefully take it into account in the here and now as well. It's up to those, who have, those of us who have studied this period 
or who have a responsibility to disseminate public history to add that corrective of balance and objectivity and inform the debate so that the kid from East Belfast who may have heard all about the Covenant learns about the Rising. The kid from West Belfast learns about Carson even though he knows about the Rising, you know. Is there a demand and an interest from the general public in exploring their history and remembering centenaries? There has been a massive increase in interest in history and not just the taught history and the formal history of the country or countries. A lot of interest in local history and a lot of interest in personal history and family history. And in this work, you can capitalise on a lot of that. You can work right out from a local story or even a family story right out into the way in which that has an influence on how we view ourselves as people and the very diverse ways in which we look at our identity now. So it is a very popular theme for the moment. Uh, we didn't realise that when we first started doing this work and in a sense we've, we've tripped over the great interest that there is in this. It's been very fortunate because it means there are lots of people who are looking for resources, looking for information, looking for an opportunity to find out more and we have the great privilege of working with the organisations that can give them that information. These are very topical issues that we're exploring and celebrating and researching into. Um, is it not a risk that the focus might move on to the next centenary that's happened maybe 10, 20 years down the line and that the, all of the work that's been set up here is maybe forgotten about or there just isn't the public interest? I think that's, that's always going to be an issue. I think the reason we took a collaborative approach here was because this period in particular was so, there was so much upheaval in Ireland and Northern Ireland, therefore it felt right to do this response here. But as the Heritage Lottery Fund, we fund history and heritage right across the UK. And we always have decades and centenaries that we're marking and key periods of history. And that will continue as long as we have national lottery money to give out for, for history and heritage projects. Our history and heritage is crucial to who we are and where we came from and our sense of self and our sense of place. And it is essential that we don't lose sight of those. What outcomes do you hope to see as a result of this event in both the long long term and the immediate future? In the immediate fu future, this is just a day to share resources and to make sure that everyone knows what everyone else is doing. And if we achieve that, this day will have achieved its purpose. In the longer run, we have a long decade to work through here. Many, many events coming up that could be very difficult for our communities to, to deal with. I hope that the message coming out of this work is that there is there's a shared history here as well as variations in how we view history and the more we can find ways to share our experience, however difficult it has been, the better we will learn to live together in the future. As the shadow of the coming half of the decade looms before us, the rising, the Somme, the rise of Sinn Féin, partition, uh, the Belfast violence of, 19, of the 1920s, you know, I think it's enabling local councils, legislators at Stormont, um, the Irish government, uh, local community groups to anticipate the difficulties and try try to give a more informed and balanced view of all this, you know, because, I mean, we're 20 years now almost after the Good Friday Agreement. We're a post-conflict society moving on. And when we remember the past, we have to get it across to people. We're also remembering the future. It's highly fitting that this morning's plaque is to a woman who made an outstanding contribution to the artistic life of this city and much further afield. My great aunt Patricia Bull Holland um, was an absolutely amazing woman and the fact that we're here to celebrate her work as part of International Woman Women's Day is very significant. We as a family are extremely privileged to be taught um, by her and that she's a major influence. International Women's Day is about showcasing the role of women in society and therefore the timing of this unveiling is truly really significant given her achievements. Patricia Mulholland was a composer, choreographer, dancer. She created uh, Irish festival dance and the Irish ballets, um, which were performed in a number of venues um, in the arts, uh, the arts theatre, um, but also um, across in Wales and Scotland. They danced in the Royal Albert Hall. Um, and I suppose she was, um, it's been said she's before her time, 
because of the fact um, that was back in the early um, 50s um, where she uh, showcased Irish festival dance and Irish music um, through her ballets um, which were based on the likes of Cahullan, Children of Lear and so on. Patricia Mulholland, her choreography was a work, work of genius. There were some things I've never ever seen or heard of anybody who could portray things, material things, anything she could portray using just the dancers themselves, using just dance. My late aunt once told me reciprocated respect could come from strange places. May I take this opportunity today on behalf of the O'Neill, Mulholland, the Fielding and O'Hare family to reciprocate my thanks for this wonderful honour for my late aunt who developed and to both Irish dance and music to a classical level. My late aunt was a remarkable woman. She fought cancer for 17 years. She looked after my grandmother, who we now would have called a dementia. And how she ever managed, she didn't sleep, so she composed and choreographed throughout the night. Now, you'll go a long way before you find a woman of such wonderful strength. She recommended scholarships for gifted children <laughs> to be accepted into Rada, Covent Garden, and also to um, Sadler's Wells. Today is, is evidence, the fact that everyone's here today, um, the, the reunion of people. Um, the, the journey in getting to having the wonderful plaque has allowed me the privilege to hear a number of anecdotes um, stories of how they met Andy Patricia, of how they performed. So it was very much about um, the confidence aspect and um, being able to perform on stage. She played for a Kelly band. She was a concert And it was whenever a fiddler was ill that Auntie P was asked to, to fill in. And she developed the love of Irish music. To hear Irish music played at a classical level and her own choreography and her own compositions are haunting. There was a, a community of dancers and there was a community of people involved and associated with Auntie Patricia. Um, and it wasn't just about choreography um, and the fact she was an amazing violinist. She also used the stage, uh, the stage set. Um, so in terms of setting a very high standard, uh, it was about um, the production uh, in those days, um, which um, was many years ago. And, and today you see several generations of dancers who speak so highly of her. Um, so it was about the, the stage production, it was about um, the, the publicising um, Irish dance, Irish festival dance um, and the ballets to um, people here, as I said, living in, in Northern Ireland um, and bringing it to a, a, a global um, stage because the filming of her ballets, um, as I'm aware, have been seen worldwide. It's about encouraging her music is recognised you know, on a global basis. She was my mentor. And um, I owe my gold medal to her teaching. And she would say, you are not going for prizes or medals. But if you do, remember, you thanked your teacher. Because without your teacher, you wouldn't know anything. The legacy is there. It's still there to be preserved. But it's in danger at the moment. I don't know how it is going to be preserved. It must be dancers, it must be people. There are people who are, who, who, who are preserving it in detached kind of ways, but it isn't being preserved in a, in, a, in a concentrated or structured kind of way. And I would really appreciate that perhaps funding could be set up to create Mulholland Academy in creative and performing arts. Young and Orange was formed in 1998 and we were set up to run the first international festival for children and young people in Northern Ireland. 
and since then this is now the 17th year. It's an international festival, it has local artists, it has theatre, dance, music, uh, visual arts, we have workshops, but mainly it's about people, professional artists who create work for children and young people. So we have um, international dance companies performing in the MAC, the Lyric, the, we have uh, the Opera House. We're also working in this kind of space, which is our pop-up space in Castleport Shopping Centre. A lot of what we do is about making sure that children across Belfast and across Northern Ireland have access to really good quality art. Um, as you can hear behind me, there's a few, there's a few already here. The reason that we're here today as part of the Children's Festival is to carry out, uh, uh, um, it's the first of the workshops which we're calling Dad Time and it's uh, an opportunity for dads and their kids or kids and their dads uh, to come down to the Office of Important Art which is uh, this uh, fantastic unit that we're standing in here in Castle Court uh, that, that Young at Art um, uh, runs throughout the year and uh, they're going to take part in, in some fun uh, uh, drama based workshops kind of creative play workshops also involving a bit of uh, a bit of interesting um, work with we've got some enormous big bits of paper which are going to be uh, involved in the uh, in the workshop where the dads and kids are going to be drawing around each other uh, and kind of creating big pictures of each other so it's going to be good fun I think it's very important to see uh, men getting involved in the lives of art with young people. Um, it was something that when I was growing up, um, it was sort of seen as a bit of a stigma. So I just like to see young men getting involved in, in the arts, and especially with children. The background to today is that um, I have been, for a long time, I've been wanting to uh, create a piece of theatre uh, performance for uh, young audiences, for, for children, uh, 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 all about dads uh, about about fatherhood um, and sort of that 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 the to try and find out what the, the explore that kind of the unique uh, nature of that relationship between dads and their kids you know what it what it's what it means to to be a dad what it means to to have a dad and um, uh, and also interestingly that it's not just um, you know biological fathers that necessarily fill that role as well you know you've got your grandfathers and you know your stepfathers um, big brothers all that kind of thing you know and um, uh, so I was lucky enough to get some funding from the Arts Council's uh, Artist Career Enhancement Scheme to uh, to develop this project and uh, also lucky enough to work in partnership with Young at Art to develop that as well. Um, they are um, my mentor organisation and they, they are um, guiding me along the way of developing this uh, this project. I think it's just very important as well to keep yourself um, guessing and, and creating art. Working for Young at Art, especially in the festival with the children, you're directly interacting with them and, and learning from them and, and playing, you know, because that's what that's what art is. It's, you know, we talk about actors playing roles and um, you get a great opportunity to play here. I think there's, a, there's an act of persuasion that we have to do. I mean, we, we firmly believe that children have not only the need, but they have the right to have creativity in their lives and all its forms into the highest standard. So we spend a lot of time talking to parents, talking to teachers, talking to school principals, talking to public bodies about how important it is that there is that kind of access and that it's not just, oh, stick a face painter in the corner and give the kids some balloons and that'll be that. Um, but there's also, I think, um, parents genuinely want to, to get the best for their children. They're looking for something that will help their children develop in life. They want their children to have fun. They want the children to enjoy themselves. They want them to be stimulated. They want to know that when they go out to an event that they'll be cared for, that people will respect them, them and their children. And we spend a lot of time working not just with artists, but with venues and with all our partners to make sure that that, that happens. We train our staff, we train our volunteers to make sure that they understand that the experience of going to an arts event is about every single aspect. Uh, a lot of the things that we do are quite alternative. Um, it might not be your atypical children's activity. You know, there's a piece um, called The Gift, uh, which is on upstairs in Castle Court. And um, it's, a, it's an interactive piece of theatre that, uh, I mean, whenever I was younger, I would never have thought about going to see and my parents probably would never have brought me to. Um, but everyone seems to be coming away saying that they loved it, it was a new experience or that you know, they couldn't believe how attentive their, their kids were to a piece of theatre or a piece of art or um, just creating a new way to play together, you know. What they have when, when they're five years old, they'll want a different experience when they're six or when they're seven. And if you miss the moment when they're five or six or seven to give them the right experience that was age appropriate, they lose out and you can't get that time back. It's different when you're an adult. You can make decisions of whether you'll put something off till next year. Children don't put things off. What well, I would hope that fathers would be walking away with today would be that 
this will have provided them with an opportunity to just take a little bit of time out of the day, out of the week, uh, that they can spend not on doing 100 other things, but just spending some time uh, with their kids um, in, a, in, a, in an environment where they are able to enjoy themselves and have fun as well and not just be the supervising adult you know at the time so they get to see their kids in a different way and the kids get to see their dads in a different way and hopefully they kind of go home having seen some things and heard some things coming from their children and vice versa with the children with their dads as well that just wouldn't normally happen in the in the day-to-day run of how things happen at home and with work and all those other things you know so it's a little bit of a little oasis in the middle of the week where by the end of the week uh where where they can enjoy that and um and that's hopefully what they'll take away today and now tomorrow's weather 